Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So there has been a bit of a kerfuffle on YouTube this week in what I guess could be described as a kind of content creator feud. Conservative YouTube commentator Steven Crowder has invoked the rage of Vox Media's own Carlos Massa, another YouTube commentator of the left-wing persuasion who hosts a series called Strike Through for Vox. Now over the past few years, Crowder has been making what you'd call rebuttal videos to Carlos's Strike Through commentary, which is fine. However, as Stephen is ultimately a comedian, he has somewhat of an edgy style here and there. During these many rebuttal videos, Stephen used a little bit of language that is perceived by many to be somewhat offensive. Carlos Massa is gay and Latino, so Stephen used a few words alluding to those aspects of Carlos's identity in a mocking way, shall we say? Nothing too horrendous, but I'm still not going to directly say those words on this channel, lest I incur the wrath of the powers that be at YouTube. That is literally the state we're in at the moment, so I have taken the necessary steps to protect myself in this video. What I will say, however, is that Stephen used the Q word, as in what the Q stands for in LGBTQ, to describe Carlos, and mentioned he has a slight lisp in conjunction with that Q word, if you get what I mean. I have included a link to a tweet in the video description, which includes a cut-together version of everything that Carlos found offensive. Anyway, Carlos outlined his concerns in a thread of tweets to YouTube that went somewhat viral on May 31st. Since I started working at Vox, Steven Crowder has been making video after video debunking Strike Through. Every single video has included repeated, overt attacks on my sexual orientation and ethnicity. These videos make me a target of ridiculous harassment and it makes life sort of miserable. I waste a lot of time blocking abusive crowd of fanboys and this sh derails your mental health. Carlos then goes on to pull the identity card. Anyway, if you want to help, I guess you can go to this dude's videos and flag them, but at YouTube isn't going to do anything because YouTube does not give a f about queer creators. It cares about engagement, and homophobic slash racist harassment is very engaging. I've also put the link to the full thread of tweets in the video description if you would like to have a read. It is quite the thing. So YouTube responded on June 4th, thanking Carlos for bringing this to their attention and saying that they would look into the matter. Finally, they came back with this. Our team spent the last few days conducting an in-depth review of the videos flagged to us, and while we found language that was clearly hurtful, the videos as posted don't violate our policies. Now, at this point, I was pretty pumped, actually. I mean, sure, Crowder said some stuff that was a bit narky, but he wasn't calling for violence or saying that Carlos's rights should be revoked because he was gay. He also wasn't encouraging his supporters to dox or harass Carlos. And now, yes, I know that the line is murky there when it comes to online pylons. You can argue that just because someone doesn't directly call for someone else to be harassed, they can still set the conditions for it, so to speak. But that is a whole nother discussion. A lot of it comes down to intent, and in the case of Crowder, he wasn't creating content with the intent of inciting a harassment campaign against Carlos. His intent was simply to rebut the videos that Carlos was making, and that is a very important distinction. Now, aside from anything else, Carlos relentlessly defines himself by his sexuality. I mean, his Twitter handle is at wonk for goodness sake. He is right there in the middle of that trendy bubble where a person's so-called identity is the defining feature of their personhood. He also has Tucker Carlson is a white supremacist in his Twitter bio. So in Carlos we have someone who one define themselves by their identity and liberally uses the word to describe themselves and two has something in their bio targeting another specific person or Tucker Carlson in a way that is highly offensive much more offensive than anything Crowder said not to mention blatantly defamatory so I'm sorry but Carlos doesn't really have grounds here to get offended by someone poking fun at him by labeling him with what he identifies as anyway when he is perfectly happy to slap false and defamatory labels publicly on his political opposition not to mention the fact that he happily advocates for what is technically assault on people he doesn't like. Really, the hypocrisy is strong in that one. Don't dish it out if you can't take it. That's the internet. So anyway, I and many others were like, wow, for once a big tech company that didn't bow to pressure from regressive lefties making a scene on Twitter. Hooray, a victory for free speech. 
However, this jubilation was short-lived. When YouTube revealed its verdict, Carlos Matza, his supporters, the Twitter sphere, and much of the media went a bit berserk. They insisted that YouTube was perfectly okay with allowing supposed homophobic and racist abuse on their platform, and everything was made doubly awkward by the fact that it is currently Pride Month, which YouTube has bought into. So, of course, it was all too easy for critics to seize on this and claim that YouTube was full of filthy hypocrites who didn't actually care about LGBT people. They hammered and hammered and hammered this home until literally the next morning, YouTube caved. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 On June 5th, Hours after saying they weren't going to do anything to penalize Crowder's channel, YouTube came out with this. Update on our continued review. We have suspended this channel's monetization. We came to this decision because a pattern of egregious actions has harmed the broader community and is against our YouTube partner program policies. Well, well, well. After putting their stake in the ground by not banning Crowder's channel, YouTube capitulated to the mob and did the next most obstructive thing. They demonetized him. Demonetizing is actually as bad as deplatforming, because yes, yeah, sure, while you can still publicize your content, a big, big chunk of your income is gone, which would make it unfeasible for many content creators to actually continue their work. I mean, would you work a week for free at a normal job? Probably not. The best way to censor anyone is to hit them in the wallet, and that is what they've done to Crowder. And while he can appeal this if he tidies up his channel to YouTube's liking and gets rid of this apparently offensive merchandise, who knows what will happen? Which is why it would be actually very, very nice if you subscribe to me right now if you're not subscribed already, because evidently content creators need all the support they can get, and I'm very close to 100,000 subscribers. So if you like my videos and you watch them regularly but haven't subscribed yet, I would really, really love it if you press the subscribe button right now. Thank you. Here we go. So. Following this thoroughly disappointing decision, YouTube released a number of explanatory blogs, including a new set of guidelines for behavior on the platform. First, an updated hate speech policy. Today, we're taking another step in our hate speech policy by specifically prohibiting videos alleging that a group is superior in order to justify discrimination, segregation, or exclusion based on qualities like age, gender, race, caste, religion, sexual orientation, or veteran status. Second, a vague warning to those who produce content that is supposedly spreading harmful misinformation and is borderline, whatever borderline may mean, I mean, that could mean anything. And third, promoting what they are calling authoritative content and sources like top news channels in recommendations and watch next panels instead of independent creators. That last bit about authoritative sources is fairly crucial. Vox Media is pretty much owned by NBC. They are major stakeholders in the company. Vox also runs The Verge, and NBC also invests in BuzzFeed, so they're all in bed together financially, and as such, are in direct competition with YouTube. We all know the traditional media and the online progressive media is a laughing stock considering their behavior over the last three years, and they are dying. YouTube is not dying, and it has a lot of independent journos and commentators on the platform that are becoming more and more popular and more and more relied upon. Therefore, of course, it is in Vox and NBC's best interests for YouTube to collapse or to be subject to a scandal. As such, you can assume that they would do whatever they could to make YouTube capitulate to them. And since now, apparently, top news channels will be promoted in the watch next and recommended lists over independent creators, well, they've done pretty well out of this, considering that NBC is a top news channel, apparently. As you can see, the new guidelines are all pretty vague and have already had an overnight effect, with dozens of content creators, including James Olsop and Red Elephants, reporting that they had woken up to notifications from YouTube that their channels would no longer be eligible for monetization. And if I'm honest with you, when I saw all of this, I had a little bit of a panic attack about my own channel, but fortunately, my channel is still monetized, at least for the moment. This is why content creators have crowdfunding platforms like Subscribestar and PayPal, because relying on YouTube to make a living is getting impossible because they do things like this with no warning. 
The other problem with sneaking in a broader policy for hate speech is that hate is subjective. This whole idea pushed by leftists that you'll know hate speech when you hear it is rubbish, because aside from a few well, objectively hateful things, Everybody has a different idea of what is hateful based on their own motivations and opinions. It is for this reason that I actually don't believe in the concept of hate speech. A lot of the time, those on the political regressive left who are obsessed with this idea of hate speech perceive speech they don't like or don't agree with with being somehow hateful simply because they don't like it or they don't agree with it. They don't believe in free speech, they believe in correct speech, and anything they don't consider to be the correct way of speaking, they demonize as hateful to discourage people from saying things that they don't like, even if the speech they don't like is the simple stating of facts. I'll give you one explanation. In Australia, our Indigenous community is in crisis and has been for some time. Amongst other things, Indigenous women are 34 to 80 times more likely to be victims of domestic abuse than non-Indigenous women. $90 million uh, put, uh, invested by the government into domestic violence campaigns. Some proportion of that was supposed to be for uh, preventing violence against Indigenous women, which ranges between 34 times the national figures to, you know, in the worst areas, 80 times. It's incredibly sad and a national disgrace, and it's owed to a lot of factors. And I think that this fact should be highlighted so that we can, you know, do something about it. However, nearly every time I have raised that on TV and any other issue that disproportionately affects the Indigenous community, I have been slammed as a racist and a bigot and accused of hate speech by the regressive left. They insist that because I have simply stated what is a fact, I am being somehow hateful even though it's a fact. They just don't like it because it's an uncomfortable fact and challenges their perception of the world. So rather than deal with it or attempt to learn more about it, they shut it down as hate speech to discourage myself and others from even raising the topic. On the flip side of this subjective perception, if I personally were to call any kind of speech hateful, well, I would most certainly call the rhetoric on the subject of men spouted by radical feminists hate speech. It's said with the intent of ridiculing and denigrating a segment of the population based on their gender and race. I mean, it sounds pretty hateful to me. Yet in the current cultural mainstream, that kind of speech is accepted, encouraged, and even celebrated as female empowerment. So you see what I mean about hate speech being subjective? It is an impossible standard to enforce and very easily abused by anyone with an agenda. You can call anything hate speech if you frame it properly, including someone simply stating uncomfortable facts, which is what a lot of right-wing YouTube channels do. Which is why YouTube's new rules are so worrying, particularly as they are deliberately vague. We'll see what happens with the Steven Crowder situation, and I am seriously hoping YouTube backs down on this and remonetizes the channel because it was the wrong decision to make and has angered an awful lot of people and put some people potentially out of a job. So in the meantime, I'm going to sit tight on my channel and pray that I don't fall to whatever is going on at YouTube. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment, and if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me.